Well, happy Wednesday. We're uh, experimenting with some old new technology we did before and we're doing again. This, instead of the computer, is going to be coming to you through the phone. So we'll see how it goes. Today in um, our poetry session, we're going to be spending a half hour with Gwendolyn Brooks and the book is Selected Poems. It's really quite a magnificent uh, book in many ways. She is the winner of the Pulitzer Prize. She is the first uh, African-American to of either sex to actually <clears throat> win the uh, Pulitzer Prize back in 1950. So she started something extraordinary in her era. Now, one of the incredible things about this is that basically she is exploring personalities, people. Listen carefully to these poems because they all describe individuals, and I'll bet most of you can all but picture the person that she is describing. This one is called Sadie and Maud. Maud went to college. Sadie stayed home. Sadie scraped life with a fine tooth comb. She didn't leave a tangle in. Her comb found every strand. Sadie was one of the livingest chits in all the land. Sadie bore two babies under her maiden name. Maud and, and Ma and Papa nearly died of shame. When Sadie said her last so long, her girls struck out from home. Sadie had left as heritage her fine tooth comb. Maud, who went to college, is a thin brown mouse. She is living all alone in this old house. This is of DeWitt Williams on his way to Lincoln Cemetery. He was born in Alabama. He was bred in Illinois. He was nothing but a plain black boy. Swing low, low, sweet, sweet chariot. Nothing but a plain black boy. Drive him past the pool hall, drive him past the show. Blind within his casket, but maybe he will know. Down by 47th Street, underneath the L, uh, and northwest corner, Prairie. Oh, that he loved so well. Oh, don't forget the dance halls, Warwick and Savoy where he picked up women, where he drank his liquid joy. Born in Alabama, bred in Illinois, he was nothing but a plain black boy. Swing low, swing low, sweet, sweet chariot, nothing but a plain black boy. Now, this one is a bit longer, but oh, do pay attention. I want your, your mind camera to be clicking shots during this one. It's called The Sundays of Sutton Legs Smith. Immemoratus, with an approbation, bestowed his title. Blessed his inclination. He wakes and winds elaborately. A cat, tawny, reluctant, royal. He is fat and fine this morning. Definite, reimbursed. He waits a moment. He designs his reign that no performance may be plain nor vain. 
then rises in clear delirium. He sheds with his pajamas shabby days. And his desertedness, his intricate fear, the postponed resentments in the prim precautions. Now, at his bath, would you deny him lavender? Or take away the, the power of his pine? What smelly substitute, heady as wine, would you provide? Life must be aromatic. There must be scent. Somehow, there must be some. Would you have flowers in his life? Oh, suggest uh, asters. <gasps> A really good geranium. A white carnation. Would you prescribe a, a show with the cold lilies, formal chrysanthemum, magnificence, poinsettias, and an emphatic red of a prize rose? Might his happiest alternative, you muse, be, after all, a bit of gentle garden in the best of taste and straight tradition? Maybe so. But you forget. Or uh, did you ever know his heritage of cabbage and pigtails, old intimacy with alleys, garbage pails, down in the deep, but always beautiful south, where roses blush their blithest, it is said, and sweet magnolias Put Chanel to shame. No, he has not a flower to his name, except a, a feather one for his lapel. You know, apart from that, if he should think of flowers, it is in terms of dandelions or death. Ah, there is little hope. You might as well... Uh, unless you care to set the world a boil and do a lot of equalizing things, remove a little ermine, say, from kings. Shake hands with paupers and appoint the men. For instance, certainly you might as well leave him his lotion, lavender, and oil. Oh, let, let us proceed. Let us inspect together with his meticulous and serious love the innards of his closet, which is a vault whose glory is not diamonds, not pearls, not silver plate with just enough dull shine, but wonder suits in yellow and in wine Sarcastic green and zebra-striped cobalt, with shoulder padding that is wide and cocky and determined as his pride, ballooning pants that taper off to ends, scheduled to choke precisely. Oh, here are hats, like bright umbrellas, and hysterical ties, like narrow banners for some gathering war. People are so in need, in need of help. People want so much that they do not know. Below the tinkling trade of little coins, the gold impulse not possible to show or spend, promise piled over and betrayed. These needed limbs receive the kiss of silk, then they receive the brave and beautiful embrace of that equivocal wool. Hmm. He looks into his mirror, loves himself, the neat curve here, the uh, angularity that is appropriate. Oh, and its place, the technique of a variegated grace. 
Here is all his sculpture and his art and all his architectural design. Perhaps you would prefer this to a fine value of marble, complicated stone. Would have him think with horror of Baroque, Rococo. You forget, and you forget. He dances down the hotel steps that keep remnants of last night's high life and distress as spat out purchased kisses and spilled beer. He swallows sunshine with a secret yelp, passes to coffee and a roll or two, has breakfasted, out sounds about him smear become a unit he hears and does not hear the alarm clock meddling in somebody's sleep children's governed sunday happiness the dry tone of a plane a woman's oath consumption spitless expectoration an indignant Robin's resolute donation, pinching a track through apathy and din, restaurant fenders weeping, and the yell that comes on like a slightly horrible thought. Pictures, too, as usual, uh, are blurred. He sees and does not see the broken windows, hiding their shame with newsprint. Little girl with ribbons decking wornness. Little boy wearing the trousers with the decentest patch. To on a Sunday, women on their way from service, temperate holiness arranged ably on asking faces. Men estranged from music and from wonder and from joy, but familiar with the guiding awe of foodlessness, he loiters. Restaurant vendors weep, or out of them rolls a restless scree, the lonesome blues, the long lost blues. I want a big fat mama. Down there, sore avenues, comes no Sanson, no piquant, elusive Greg, and not Tchaikovsky's wayward eloquence, and not the shapely tender drift of Brahms. But could he love them? Since a man must bring to music what his mother spanked him for when he was two, bits of forgotten hate, devotion, whether or not his mattress hurts, the little dream his father humored, the thing his sister did for money, what he ate for breakfast, and for dinner 20 years ago, last autumn, all his skipped desserts. The pasts of his ancestors lean against him, crowd him, fog out his identity. Hundreds of hungers mingle with his own. Hundreds of voices advise so dexterously he quite considers his reactions his he, he judges and, and most powerfully alone that everything simply what is but movie time approaches time to boo the hero's kiss and boo the heroine whose ivory and yellow it is sin for his eye to eat of the mickey mouse however is for everyone in the house Squires his lady to dinner at Joe's Eats. His lady, 
alters as to leg and eye, thickness and height, oh, such minor points as these, from Sunday to Sunday. But no matter what her name or body, positively, she's in Queen Lace stockings with ambitious heels that strain to kiss the calves and vivid shoes, frontless and backless. Chinese fingernails, earrings, three layers of lipstick, intense hat dripping with the most voluble of veils. Her affable extremes are like sweet bombs about him, whom no middle grace or good could gratify. He has no education in quiet arts of compromise. He would not understand your counsels on control nor thank you for your late trouble. At Joe's Eats, you get your fish or chicken on meat platters with coleslaw, macaroni, candied sweets, coffee and apple pie. You go out full. The end is, isn't it, all that really matters? And even an intrepid come the tender boots of night to home. Her body is like new brown bread underneath the Woolworth mignonette. Her body is a honey bowl whose waiting honey is deep and hot. Her body is like summer earth receptive. Now, could you picture him if you saw him walking down his, the street in his zebra-striped suit? In honor of David Anderson Brooks, my father. Now, just a word. Brooks was born in 1917. Um, her family moved to Chicago um, eventually when she was very young. Her father was a janitor. Her mother was a teacher. Uh, and she lived in a very close-knit community. One thing I didn't mention to you, when you see books with this cover, always look to the back because there are some interesting uh, sections about the author, about the book, and other information that you might wish to pursue if this subject has intrigued you. And now, in honor of David Anderson Brooks, my father, July 30th, 1883, to November 21st, 1959. A dryness is upon the house my father loved and tended. Beyond his firm and sculptured door, his light and lease have ended. He walks the valleys now, replies to sun and wind forever. Oh, no more the cramping chambers chill, no more the hindering fever. Now, out upon the wide, clean air, my father's soul revives, all innocent of self-interest, and the fear that strikes and strives. He who was goodness, gentleness, and dignity is free, translates to public love, old private charity. The Bean Eaters. They eat uh, beans mostly, this old pear, yellow pear. Dinner is a casual affair. Plain chipware on a plain and creaking wood. Tin flatware. Two who are mostly good. Two who have lived their day, but keep on putting on their clothes and 
putting things away and remembering, remembering with twinklings and twinges as they lean over the beans in their rented back room that is full of beads and receipts and dolls and cloths, tobacco crumbs, faces and fringes. Now I'm going to read a poem I read to you months ago. It was and is still one of my musical favorites. And looking at this book, I learned something new, which I'll share with you when I read the title. There was a little bit uh, underneath it that is very explanatory and wasn't in the version that I read to you. Title, We Real Cool. Subtitle, The Pool Players, Seven at the Golden Shovel. We real cool. We left school. We lurk late. We strike straight. We sing sin. We thin gin. We jazz June. We die soon. <laughs> Old Mary. My last defense is the present tense. It little hurts me now to know I shall not go cathedral hunting in Spain, nor cherrying in Michigan or Maine. The last quatrain of the ballad of Emmett Till. The murder after the burial. Emmett's mother is a pretty faced thing, the tint of pulled taffy. She sits in a red room drinking black coffee. She kisses her killed boy, and she is sorry. Chaos in windy grays through a red prairie. Mrs. Small. Mrs. Small went to the kitchen for her pocketbook and came back to the living room with a peculiar look and the coffee pot. Pocketbook, pot, pot, pocketbook. The insurance man was waiting there with superb and cared for hair. His face did not have much time. He did not glance with sublime love upon the little plump tan woman with the half opened mouth and the half mad eyes and the smile half human who stood in the middle of the living room floor Planning apple pies and graciously offering him a steaming coffee pot, pocketbook pot. Oh, Mrs. Small came to her senses, peered earnestly through thick lenses, jumped terribly. Oh, this too was a mistake. Unforgivable, no matter how much she had to bake, for there can be no whiter whiteness than this one. An insurance man's shirt on its morning run. This Mrs. Small, now soiled with a pair of brown spurts just recently boiled of the very best coffee in town. The best coffee in town is what you make, Delphine. There is none dandier. And those were the words of the pleased Jim Small, who was no bandier of words at all. Jim Small was likely to give you a good swat when he was not pleased. 
He was absolutely no bandier. Oh, I, I don't know where my mind is this morning, said Mrs. Small, scorning uh, apologies. Oh, for there was so much for which to apologize. Oh, such mountains of things. She'd never get anything done if she, if she for, beg, uh, begged forgiveness for each one. She paid him. But apologies and her hurry would not mix. The six daughters were a yell, a scramble in the hall. The four sons' horrors could not be heard anywhere at all. No, the insurance man would have to glare idiotically into her own sterile stare a moment, then depart, leaving her to release her heart and dizziness and silence her six and mix her spices, and core and slice her apples, and find her four, continuing her part of the world's business. The Chicago Defender sends a man to Little Rock, fall 1957. In Little Rock, the people bear babes and comb and part their hair and watch the want ads uh, put repair to roof and latch. While wheat toast burns, a woman waters multi ferns. Time upholds or overturns the many tight and small concerns. In Little Rock, the people sing Sunday hymns like anything through Sunday pomp and polishing. And after testament and tunes, some soften Sunday afternoons with lemon tea and Lorna dunes. I forgessed, and I believe, come Christmas, Little Rock will cleave to Christmas tree and trifle, weave from laugh and tinsel, texture fast. Little Rock is baseball, baccarol, that hotness in July, the uniform figures raw and implacable, and not intellectual. Batting the hotness, a clawing the suffering dust, the open air concert on the special twilight green, when Beethoven is brutal, or whispers to ladylike air. Blanket sitters as solemn as Johann troubles to learn to tell them what to mean. There is love, too, in Little Rock. Soft women softly opening themselves in kindness or pitying one's blindness, awaiting one's pleasure in azure, glory with anguished rose at the root, to wash away old semi-discomfitures. They reteach purple and unsullen blue. The wispy soils go, and uncertain half-havings have they clarified too. Sure. In Little Rock, they know. Not answering the telephone is a way of rejecting life. That it is our business to be bothered is our business to cherish bores or boredom, be polite to lies and love and many faceted fuzziness. I scratch my head, massage the hate I had. I, I blink across my prim and penciled pad. The saga I was sent for is not down because there is a puzzle in this town. The biggest do news I do not dare telegraph to the editor's chair. They are like people everywhere. The angry editor would reply in hundred harryings of why and true. They are hurling spittle, rock, garbage, and fruit in Little Rock. 
And I saw coiling storm arise on bright Madonnas. And a scythe of men harassing brownish girls. The bows and barrettes in the curls and braids declined away from joy. I saw a bleeding brownish boy. The, the lariat lynch wish I deplored. The loveliest lynchy was our Lord. A sunset of the city, Kathleen Eileen. Already I am no longer looked at with lechery or love. My daughters and sons have put me away with marbles and dolls. Are gone from the house. My husband and lovers are pleasant or somewhat polite. And night is night. It is a real chill out, the genuine thing. Oh, I am not deceived. <clears throat> I do not think it still summer because the sun stays and birds continue to sing. It is summer gone that I see. It is summer gone. The sweet flowers in drying and dying down. The grasses forgetting their blaze and consenting to brown. It is real chill out. The fall crisp comes. I am aware there is winter to heed. There is no warm house that is fitted to my need. I am cold in this house, this home, whose washed echoes are tremulous. Down lost halls, I am a woman and dusty, standing among new affairs. I am a woman who hurries through her prayers. Tin intimations of a quiet core to be, my desert and my dear relief. Come, there shall be such islanding from grief and small communion with the master shore. Twang they. And I incl incline this ear to tin, uh, consult a dual dilemma, whether to dry and humming pallor or to leap and die. Somebody muffled it. Somebody wanted to joke. The crazy woman. And after this, two more. I shall not sing a May song. A May song should be gay. I'll wait until November and sing a song of gray. I'll wait until November. That is the time for me. I'll go out in the frosty dark and sing most terribly. And all the little people will stare at me and say, that is the crazy woman who would not sing in May. Now, Gwendolyn Brooks was not above commenting on other people as well. Here is a <clears throat> brief observation of Robert Frost. There is a little lightning in his eyes, iron at the mouth. His brows ride neither too far up nor down. He is splendid with a place to stand, some glowing in the common blood some specialness within of 
Langston Hughes. She has to say, Is Mary glory, is salutary, yet grips his right of twisting free. Has a long reach, strong speech, remedial fears, and muscular tears. Holds horticulture in the eye of the vulture, in firm profession, in the compression, in mud and blood and sudden death, in the breath of the Holocaust. He is helmsman, hatchet, headlight. See, one restless in the exotic time and ever till the air is cured of its fever. And so I encourage you to visit with Gwendolyn Brooks. She has many more observations. There are many more people to meet. And please feel free to visit Gwendolyn Brooks at Story and Song. Now come Friday, we're going to have some interesting prose to share with you. Have a good rest of the day, and I hope to see you again on Friday. <laughs>